We're really excited for today's speaker, uh, Joan Busquets, who is a towering figure in, in urban design in the past decades. Uh, we're thrilled to have him join us. Um, the uh, concept of the lecture series is really to have a global perspective and to have um, urban designers in practice from many generations, from different generations. And, um, and so in, you, you've heard uh, so far from figures like Dirk Simons of HNS Land of Holland, uh, uh, PK Das, Mumbai, uh, and uh, coming up, uh, Ciudad Emergente and others. And so really getting a, a truly global view on forms of practice and, and contexts of urban design practice. So uh, Professor Busquets is an architect, uh, urban designer, and professor in practice in urban design at Harvard GSD. And for some reason, Columbia and Harvard have not so much interaction, but here we are uh, breaking the firewall. And I'm so thrilled uh, that you would agree to join us uh, today. And so, so thankful uh, to have you. Um, and his urban practice encompasses strategy in all realms. Um, and he works primarily in a European context. And I really uh, enjoyed his uh, lecture title, Plans Versus Projects. Uh, and because it's really, you know, suggesting that cities are more than physical infrastructures, but reflections on society and transformations over time. And I believe he has a, a book with his students out called Urban Grids, Handbook for Regular City Design, which um, encompasses the work of, of, of um, uh, his students and his, his teaching uh, in the GSD in past years. And so again, yeah, I do feel like uh, we'll hear through his, his lecture and his slides, but uh, Joan has really um, advanced a mode of practice in urban design in the past decades that has really sort of stood uh, as an incredible model uh, of thinking uh, urbanistically and uh, integrating design and design practice into uh, this uh, form of, of, of city making. So with that, I will turn it over to you and just say welcome again. We couldn't be more thrilled to have your voice and your perspective as part of this global lecture series. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kate, for the, for the invitation and also for the introduction. I'd like to just start uh, <clears throat> sharing the, the screen to, to show the... Could you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Now, as, as you already presented, Kate, I, I want to develop this idea. In terms of designing the city and the perspective of the urban designer, what is better, that we do plans for the city or we do actions that we sometimes we call that projects is the way that is something that they want to put on the table and to start the discussion about this uh, type of things because it seems to me that it's very very important to see what the role of the urban design today in our society which is uh, completely different than the one that probably uh, one generation ago it was learning at the schools in the way that also still we can say that the presence of these type of paradigms that they were also created by the modern architecture we can see in this image to the left we can see uh, the idea from the Corbusier the, the Ville Radies in, in Paris I mean that was the idea that you have a plan and by having the plan you solve all the questions of the city but we when we compare the left with the right we can see that our cities has been always in a very big transformation. You can see on the upper, on the corner at the top, we can see New York like it was 150 years ago and probably like, like it was 20 years ago. But anyway, we can see the dramatic change that it took 100 years in New York, but in other cities, if you make the same exercise in Shanghai or Mumbai or many other cities, we can see that these changes are done in 30, 40 years. In a few decades, you can see our city is booming. But at the same time, the, the form of the city, we can see on the bottom down, the form of the city is very difficult to, to find one form. And usually the urban designers that they are trained, they are coming from the architectural background, like myself, we tend to imagine that the things always get form. The form could be the form of the pencil, could be a, a bottle, could be anything that we want. 
but everything has a form. But sometimes when you see a city and on the corner down on the right, we can see Milan. Uh, Milan is a city that is probably presented many times the, like the capital of design. And the capital of, of design is this lower part, which is a very beautiful city. But the real economy of the city is outside in all these gigantic sprawl of many activities, uh, many economic activities and many different sorts of housing. And that is the real city. And that is the real economy that makes the, the, the center of the city that is called design. The capital of the design is also a very successful city. So what, what else? What is the problem today? The probably we need to create, we have to fight for defining new paradigms yeah? that probably cannot be like the one that it was proposed on the left by Le Corbusier, or even with the idea of the projects you can see on the on down, you have a complete project, which is beautifully done in the North of Africa, it is very well designed anyway, but you can see the real city is behind, is around it, is the way then. What is the real paradigm? Is that, are they designing the outskirts or are they designing the center or the two are together? Otherwise, this uh, industry, this company town cannot work. That's the reason that I think, and I what I'm proposing is more than just a fixed system. I propose an attitude. And I like this image, probably you know, is the image that I like the attitude of these school, uh, school girls in Shenzhen, what they are looking at to this gigantic city that all these transformations being happening only two decades. And they are looking at that. And I think what is important is that they are approaching from, from the right angle. And they are searching the top of the building, but they are also trying to find the proper tools. And that is what probably urban design should be. We have to get the way that we can understand this complexity and we can, we must be able to dig and to work into this uh, complexity with the tools, with the purpose we may have, with the power that we can have. Because sometimes we feel urban design is only following the established power. It's not true. There is always a gigantic amount of a scope of contested terrain where we can work and we can make different proposals for the city. Yeah? And I think this is what I like very much to stress. Our job is a very interesting and very difficult job, but we have to have, and I think this is what I, the first thing I'd like to, is a technical job because we have to prepare for that, but it's also with the social commitment. I think it's very important in what side of the table are we sitting and what are we aiming for that particular reality. And I think this is what probably is very, very important. At the same time, our, our field, urban design, is something that needs theory. I know it's not so easy to talk about the theory and urban design because, in fact, we have to address the physical reality. And sometimes we feel that only by solving these uh, uh, physical problems, we are doing a lot. And it's true. But what is the frame? What is the, the aim for that? And that, I think, is what we should call theory. And theory that touch different scales. And I think that is probably what we are going to see along my lecture today is this idea that we have to, we're crossing different scales. Sometimes we start from the larger scale and we are zooming down, or sometimes we are bottom up and we are creating a new reality from a very a small portion of the city. And in this context, in this discipline, I would say a relatively new discipline that we can call the urban design, is where we need also a continuous research, but also the research must be applied because in a way it's not a research from a laboratory, like sometimes we, we, we feel and the chemics uh, the chemistry has this advantage that they can be isolated in a lab to doing that, but our lab sometimes is the reality that we have to, to understand, and only by understanding the reality we can probably make the proposals. I'm going to make my speech divided into parts. The first is I'm going to use material that some of you perhaps are familiar, is this research that we did uh, 15 years ago, the GSD, it, it, it is called the city's 10 lines. The, I thought when we were doing the research that everybody will understand the X. Then I discovered it's not true. People feel we are talking about the X forms or the X cities. No, this X means 10 in the Roman, <laughs> the, 
the Roman alphabet, and I was I was studying Latin, and that's the reason I I, <laughs> I like to stress this idea. Ten, ten different forms that we are designing the city today. I'm not going to repeat that because this book is quite well known, but today I'm going to read these approaches in four different conditions. Probably we can imagine or we can agree that our cities are facing different questions. I'm going to select four of them. We can enlarge and we can make six, eight, that doesn't matter, but they are different conditions. And we, as the urban designers, sometimes we have the chance to decide if a city needs more the second model, is the way that the city is better that the grow is decentralized, is the way, or if the city should grow continuously, extending, we can call. Or some other times we have to say, no, the priority of the city is not extending. The priority of the city is to retrofitting the city in itself. And that could be another, another pattern. And the fourth that I'm going to develop is when we have an existing city and the city needs a certain transformation or requalification in some parts that that should be many times is related to infrastructure that they are oversized or they need to be rescaled or whatever. I mean, they are meant to. And that is what I'm going to show. Let's take a first example, extending the city. Anyway, that is a project that I want to, to show you is a project in Portugal, in Évora. It's a mid-sized city in that country where they have a, a project to make an extension because the city has um, is prepared for the growth, but they did didn't know exactly what is the program for this area, and and they have uh, they they have prepared a project for expansion of the city like this type of what we call a housing estate for that area. The project is done by Alvaro Cesar, and Cesar was proposing doesn't make any sense to continue making more city done by blocks because we don't know exactly the programs and the needs of the people coming into the city. Why we don't prepare a system where depending on the needs, then the housing can be adjusted. I'm not saying that the housing, the, the houses are going to be a squat or built by themselves, but they are going to be managed under the direction of the, the families that they could be interested or needed to live in that place. That's the reason that he is proposing a very interesting scheme and I think it's what sometimes when we take the, the terms of these 10 lines, we said a minimalist approach could be very interesting in some cases. When we don't know the program, we don't have a lot of budget, but we have a very important urgent need to solve, eh? like the housing in this Ebora case. Then perhaps it's better, and that is the hypothesis of Caesar, that by defining an element is, uh, that is a sort of an aqueduct, that is an infrastructural line, and then putting the service along this line, as soon as we have a small group of people that they want to, to build or to have some housing in that place, we can just build one of these pieces and then plug in and connect it into that system eh? by making this linear uh, service development and then plug in the, the scheme. And eh? you can see here the way that is developed along the time. And the way here you can see the, the service line is very simple. It's just like a viaduct, it's like an aqueduct, sorry. And then you put the services and then as soon as you have then, you can imagine a cooperative that organizing 15, 20 of a group of dwellers and then could be by a system of two families. And then you, you can build something that could follow this very simple minimalistic type of architecture that has no other um, ambition than the one of producing something that you can very well imagine that if they need later another uh, uh, layer they can add and they can put easily some other rooms if needed. Yeah? That could be the, the type of street that they produce, which the means and you can see the way that the people are reacting into that system and they produce something. This image is already 15 years old, but now this space in the middle is quite nice uh, space. But what for me is interesting is this idea that in place of creating a nice uh, mega uh, building, uh, that is what many times the housing estates are produced, 
which we don't know exactly the program, the needs, the, the priorities, the time of that, makes a gigantic investment, many times from the public sector, and they are they are always not properly used, or sometimes they they are empty or they are vandalized in the way that they can be. Second point of discussion. In other cases, we can say that the territory needs to be expanded because otherwise everything is very much growing continuously, and then the decentralization it makes sense. I'm not discussing now that decentralization in itself is good or bad. But we can say that in some cases, the cities, the gigantic cities and the megalopolis, they cannot stay continuously growing um, by, um, by a continuous system. Sometimes you need to prepare to reserve certain natural space and then you, you have to, to find other strategies for the growth or to balance perhaps in other conditions. When we look at these different models, and you can see if you compare London, which is the most typical example for decentralized, they were doing this system of relatively autonomous new towns. That has been quite repeated in many different places. I, we can say that there is no any big city that doesn't have any new town model. Uh, you can see in, in Shanghai when they decided to make nine different new towns, but detached from the, the existing city just to produce a sort of decentralization of the economy, but also to people related to this economy can be uh, placed in that place with the services and all these elements that they are probably um, considered in the base of the decentralized model. I like to straight the, the third model, which is here on the right, is that this is in, in the Netherlands. You can see that in place of making nine or 12, like in, in London, they make more than 100. Are they, they need that? No, but what they need is more a system, a plan for it. The cities that they need to expand, they can apply and they can develop on that. In place of making an abstract model like the one that we see in the middle, they are more considering that these new parts are going to be according to the needs and according to the model of the different cities. I think that was very interesting as a way that they are not even calling new town, they call Phoenix. Yeah, that is the program that was developed in the 80s as a, as a general plan, a general master plan for the whole country, a general strategy, and then allowing that every piece can have its own autonomy. I think that is what they tried to develop, that we had the chance to, to participate in one of these discussions that was in, in, in the outskirts of Rotterdam, yeah, where the strategy in this project is it is creating from an existing lake, creating the land to avoid that the city was based on agricultural um, agricultural domain in the way, and in place of then reserving the agricultural land and creating by digging, you can see the the, the, the section here where you can take um, you can change. The, the depth of the of the lake and then with the land that you can get then you can raise the land and you reduce the impact and increasing the density you can do that yeah? that could be the model and the scheme for that what is the the subject in that case the decentralization it will respond not only to the locating the housing but also allowing that some new economy that that was already decided to be related with some of these Phoenix will take advantage of that. And then the idea of the address, the public address of the place could be created by the existence of the lake. The lake becomes deeper, but also is, is like that is relatively small. And then they decided that all the sports activity in the lake will be allowed except anything with engine is the way then you can do whatever you want in that place. But you know, because otherwise most of these model about the decentralization, probably the center always is a shopping mall. No? And the way that then you make the shopping mall and around you have some facilities, the school, and then housing and some industrial area. That is the model. Why we don't take something that belongs to the geography of the place, eh? but reinforcing that, you can imagine that you can develop. Eh? The other consideration in this project is the density. We feel that if we want to save land, we have to raise a certain level of density, even that 
um, that the overall density is relatively low, but is above one square meter per square meter. You can see here from the distance, this idea that the, the town has an image like um, an existing town. We can say today this image for me, Rotterdam is a city with, with towers. That is what probably belongs to the, and then the rest from the part from the tower is the idea of the urban block. You build the blocks in a way that then different sort of housing can be contributing and creating the concept of a certain hybridity. I know that when we are building a place like that, there is a place for 20,000 inhabitants and the economy around um, attracted and this proportion, but also are also people working in that area that they, they are coming from, from the city of Rotterdam. Then the connection by the subway is the way that then you have a link with the public transportation into that, yeah, that be, becomes part of this network around um, Rotterdam. And then the other important point is how can we build blocks that they are creating a real mixed use? Yeah. Sometimes we like the mixed use, but we don't have enough commercial activity or we don't have enough ground floor. Then we consider in that place why we don't make also the mix with the housing. And then if in every block you have affordable housing, social housing, market housing, but you have also housing for the elderly people and perhaps normal families or more conventional families, then you produce a social mix that works quite well. And then according to the discussion with the population, we come up with this principle that in the end it, it has been quite successful in the way it works. And then you have the towers and then you have the lower blocks but also the important thing is in the land that is recently created is very difficult to stabilize the land no? because then you raise the, the level of the and how you create a promenade eh, in front of the in front of the water and that then probably is a technical issue very important how to, could you make the, the the promenade in terms to make it stable eh? because always we know in, in the tradition the promenade in front of the water is a place where you have the people that they are engaged with the water and the people that they are using the upper part of the promenade because they are looking at the water, but they are also watching what happens on the people that they are bathing or they are doing a sports activities into that. I think this is the way that then you create a place where that can be reflected is the change between the new land that is created and the land that in fact corresponds to that. That could be just an image of that is the way that then all this is um, done with this idea that the hybridity is about the the functions that the economy can create, but also how different sorts of housing can be mixed and creating this idea. The third condition is when we have the chance or we, we feel the most important thing is to improve the city. That is an example in Toledo. Toledo is a is a very beautiful city, is at the top of the rock, is in the middle of Spain. You can see the situation, the city, how it was, and the two images uh, differ some 60 years, is the way, but the city is not changing because everybody feels that at the top of the rock, of the rock, this is a monumental place. Eh? That is the place of the maps of the history. I mean, this is the Greco interpretation of the that is a very beautiful painting. And then we come up with the idea that the city has been always this way. But the fact is, and the people living, I remember doing this project with the city, the city was very proud of that. So that's attention. Toledo is always very beautiful. It's been this way. Okay, okay, you are right. But let's look at the what happened in Toledo. Toledo was empty. It was beautiful, but empty. Nobody was living in most of these places. Why? Because the people prefer new dwellings outside in the valley, and they prefer to have new toilets and the kitchen and the facilities, and the old houses doesn't have any of these service. Then you have the problem that you have a city with beautiful monuments, you can see on the left, and you have a lot of housing that is quite empty. In, in a situation where you can see that the river is really isolating the almost the rock, eh? the city is like the rock, and then the lower part is where the new housing being located. 
But you can see that the city is beautiful in a very hot um, climate, is the way then there are all the protections. But it's a city that is very difficult to imagine how you can make modern use of, the, of that part of the city. Then we said perhaps in those cases, perhaps it would be very nice if we consider that the building, either that they are empty, like these huge containers, or the parts that could be redeveloped, but those should be put in one document. We can say that the drawing is the plan of the city. Because anyway, we tend to imagine that the plan is something that we draw over uh, a blank piece of paper. And it's not true. Always there is a certain reality that it could inform a lot. And in the case of the historical towns, it informs a lot more than, than the other places because you cannot imagine that those buildings cannot be recycled. Then a great deal of the discussion with the population and with the, with the city responsible is going to be what are the uses for that? And then is what we can learn from other cities. And in that case, we learn a lot from Italian cases. And we said that perhaps a good strategy that in place to make the campus of the new university in Toledo outside, like that was the pattern to make in the new land, perhaps some of these buildings, that they are beautiful architectural containers, can be refurbished as a library, as certain departments of the university. And that, that was the model that was really um, taken. But the other thing it was, they were saying, the buildings in Toledo, they had always been like this. And how they work, that, that was our question. How works the city? Because the streets you have seen are very narrow. What happens is that all the buildings has a courtyard. And is the courtyard the way that these buildings are working? If you understand that, that point, that is what we discover, uh, the system. After that, we were safe. Because meaning that then the city can be refurbished. Eventually, if one building falls down, you can rebuild because then you know the logic of the, of, of the construction of the city. That doesn't mean that sometimes we have to be very keen in our research, discovering what are the real rules of, the, of this urban form. Then by using that, we can really probably imagine how we can refurbish the buildings. And the buildings can be retreated with modern and contemporary architecture, but they should follow the morphological pattern that belongs to the to the city, to the tradition of the city. This is the the real. It's not a style. The city. So, you know, there are certain reasons that they are. Those are the the ones that form the city in itself. The third important question it was the the access to the city. As we saw, the streets are very narrow. They don't have capacity. Then we should get rid of the cars. And this project was done 20 years ago. It was not easy to pass this uh, discussion because also the people want to return to the city center, but what I will do with my car, if I have a car or with my motorbike or whatever. Or, uh, that, that was the reason to say, okay, perhaps a city like that, they need to create a sort of silos outside for the people that they are, they need to get by mechanical um, vehicles to the city, and only the residents has the capacity in a smaller um, locations to be reserved into the city center. Uh, we study other cases, and then we come up with this idea. You can see here, uh, outside the wall, this is the wall of the city, there is a, a parking underground here. And then from this parking, you leave your motorbike or you need whatever you have, the car, then you pass under the, the wall and then you take the escalators and go up until the top of that. Yeah? The city has a denivelation between 40 and 50 meters, which is quite a, a tall building if you have to reach the top. Yeah? That could be the way that you are approaching. And that I think we discovered and we study that uh, carefully the people, uh, when you compare the escalators with the lifts, because at the beginning, the, the city administration, they, they don't like the escalators, said, okay, the escalators, they said, is more for department stores. But we come up and we study that in Italian cases. And then we saw that the lifts, the people are scary of the public lifts. And the escalators, if they have a natural light uh, and ventilation, they are really working quite well. 
every day um, approximately 20,000 people are moving up and down to the city for studying, for visiting other people or for the culture. And that's the reason that after the first, we did the second intervention also like this one that you can see in that, which is behind this existing wall of the, of the city. And that could be the way that you come up. Then you can see in the historical town, the way that the architecture can be deployed is really could be contemporary. But what is very important is that the morphology of this intervention, like you can see here, you is a building that doesn't have a facade, it's just behind that, in, embedded into the mountain. And then from the lower part, you take that, and then from the escalators up, you reach the top of that. I think the idea of the retrofitting the historical town is something, of course, that is not also only a European commitment. I think all of our cities across the globe, the people like to, to keep and to reuse, to modernize the, the, the parts of the city and to make out of it a real uh, identity for the city of the future. Yeah. That's another example that we did, that is in France, in Toulouse, that is a city very dynamic economically. Yeah. But the city center is huge. That is more than 300 hectares. And because the economy of the city is good, is good, meaning that then there are a lot of cars. There are more cars than any other city. I mean, it's amazing. Huh? How you can struggle with a place that is so beautiful in terms of the architecture, then you, you can imagine that they, you're going to start dissociating and understanding what are the, the different types of that and the way that those areas and the public space into these areas can be reorganize uh, in terms of the mobility. Today, the mobility is something that everywhere uh, is uh, how the public sector, how other forms of uh, movement can be deployed, how the, the electric car, but we should not imagine that we uh, insist on the car because now it's going to be not polluting, is electric. It's not only that. In the city centers, we should walk. We have other means and only a few people probably they need to use other other systems. That's the reason that here, because it was very difficult to deal about this um, subject, because you have the cars and everything is going fine. How you, in a democratic context, how you can get that? And probably we decided that perhaps it makes sense just to make certain projects like a pilot projects. And then we said, perhaps it will make sense if there is this central spine in the middle of the city, that is the north-south axis, that links the most important monuments and places into the city, and the river is very beautiful, but it was really neglected, why would not make the link between that? And then by refurbishing some of these streets, the people can see that to get rid of the car in the street can be a benefit for everybody. Yeah? And the way that that is... You can see the, the quality of the street. The buildings are very nice, but the, the street is very poor. And why is poor is because it's a lot of a space dedicated for motorbikes and cars park on it. If you make this exercise easily, you can imagine that it becomes a friendly space and you, you can see that. Then you discover that and you show that and everybody can, can see what you can get and what in the end you can you can produce out of it uh, introducing then certain elements that and addressing this place towards the water and uh, towards the river and so on. that that was a strategy and then by doing that you can go one piece after the other the river was extremely beautiful but it was neglected because it was flooding but today in the last 20 years the rivers in these type of urban conditions are safe and they are controlled and then you can imagine that those places could be places that the people enjoy as a as a meeting places eh? and that was probably the strategy and then you have to try to find the way of rediscovering that you can see the lower part of the river and the upper part eh? what's the reason of this wall it was the flooding but then you have to touch the upper part of the city and the lower part eh? if you do that you can very well imagine that by doing a very simple intervention, you make easily to move down and the, the top, and then you can get that as a way. Yeah? That that so way that then after that you can imagine that the people are start creating 
the use that the, the car can be used for other type of trips, but the movements into the city, you can get rid of the, of the car, which probably is what could be the conclusion of this simple exercise, but done uh, one piece after the other in order to produce this idea that retrofitting the city is not something that we can do overnight. Eh? And probably all the urban design projects takes a lot of time. Eh? All the projects I have shown you, they take at least 10 years because they need the time, they need to be implemented, they need to be adjusted. Eh? I think probably that is another important consequence of the urban design. The fourth um, <clears throat> condition, the final condition is about when the cities has problem with the infrastructure. This is the city of Delft in Netherlands. Beautiful city, no point about that. The train arrives in the middle of 19th century and was placed next to the city, but today is in the middle of the city. You have a beautiful city, fantastic, but you have in the middle the train that was filling the river. And as a way then you have something like, because Delft is in the middle of the country, 300 trains per day, which is impossible to live in nearby this area. The hypothesis here, the city and the region, the authority said, perhaps we have to get rid of the train and we place the train outside the city. We make a new town. We make something very nice out of it. But we realized that if they do that, they lose the quality of the people living in the Delft, quite high density city, beautiful. You can see from Vermeer and eh, that the city is still like that. And eh, that is the famous, the famous Dutch painter that you can see that when at the beginning it was um, the windmill and then you have the river, the train comes in, they fill the river, but nothing happened because it was one train a week. That's not a problem. But then after they start intensifying the train and then what happened? Then they, they lifted in a viaduct the train. When do you do that, you break the connection between one part of the city and the other. You are in the middle of the city. The solution it was to create the train, to place the train underground because the train, it was not enough. They have to be double the number of tracks because of the, is the north-south axis in Europe. That was the situation before. You can see the windmill building here in the middle of the picture. You can see under it was a parking, you know, it, it was really a mess, but it was a cut like a knife in the middle of the city. That was, then we have this capacity of rendering, doing an image of how it could be, is the one, because that is, uh, is difficult. And then if we can put the train underground, perhaps even we can, we can return the, the, the river in its own place. Because Delft is a polder city, the water is not just for make it nice. The water is something that you need to make a stable the land of the city. And that is the, the condition of that. Then we developed this strategy, which is a project where you can see that is based on a system of layers. It's very simple what I'm describing, because the way you understood immediately, if you take at that, you put the train below ground, you you place the water and then it's it, just do that. But we know, and I think this is what the tools that we have today, that if we start a project like that and we don't control exactly each layer, I know that the last layer, what is the last layer? The trees. If we do that, probably in the end are going to be only a few trees. And then in our team, it was one responsible only for the trees. And this person in any discussion has to save these 13,000 trees that are going to be in this project in Slovenia, that probably in the development of the project we lose 100 trees, but is 1% of, of that. But any layer has its own value. And I think today is very important to do. And we have to design, for instance, even the things that they are going to happen in place of, the, of these rail tracks, how the buildings are going to, the urban design has to make the form of that, even that we don't know the program. We don't know who is going to live, who is going to build that, but we have to start getting and producing images, real images that they create visibility. And that is the river, how you can rescue the river, how you can cross the river to make the continuation of the streets. 
that is under construction. You can see, you can imagine the construction of this a place like that is not easy. I mean, that the construction wise is, it was four years, 24 hours, seven days a week. And that is the only city where you can see the model when that is built, you can see the river, you can see the station. The city decided assembling together the station and the new town hall in one single building that is done the building by Meccano and we took care of the organization of that and the public space and then new housing is under realization you can see here the old station that is today done as a as a civic building for the population it, it looks like a station but it's not any longer the station the station is on the lower part you can see here under where is the the town hall and then under you have here the gigantic parking for the bicycles 10,000 parking places in that place and there is no a single car only the tram and the buses everything is organized like that and the parking is 150 meters on the south on the other side you can park you have to pay chair expensive if you if you if you park there but nevertheless you you get decentrality and that is a current image like it is today is the way that then you you make the connection between both sides and you introduce other users that you cannot imagine because today the river is not any longer for boats they are getting goods into the city but there are other users that they are probably making possible the way that this project can be developed you can see that then urban design in those cases has a lot to do with this idea of crossing and touching different scales, but also addressing this question of the public space, the large public space and the infrastructure. I think today to rescale the infrastructure is a main job and we have to, to put all of our efforts into that. As I said, in place of these four examples, we can expand and we can find other examples. That's not the problem. But I think what for urban designer is important is that we must be prepared to understand these different conditions. And when we have a problem of any given city, we have to imagine if after the studying and diagnosing the city, we know if that city needs more this type of approach or the others, or others that we can discuss later. Then I was really very much trying to stress this idea of the complexity of the projects, but at the same time, the capacity of the projects. I think urban design today, in terms of definition, sometimes there is urban design, is urban architecture, is urban landscape, is landscape urbanism, what, what is it? Is way. I don't feel that we should struggle in the question of names. We should struggle in the capacities of creating ideas and theory for making these things happen and making the interventions of our cities, better cities and better uses for the citizens. I think this is our goal and eh? that I insist in our social commitment is very important. The second part, I like to address this question of the theory, how we can create ideas of the theory that can be also developed in practice. Theory that touches the question of the urban practice, eh? like the one that that probably this series of lectures is addressing. Here we devote um, something like eight years of the research and some seminars and some studios at the GSD on this question of the urban grid. The main question is why the city is regular? And most of our cities are regular. And then we did the studios on Manhattan, Hanzhou, or Barcelona, or Chicago, and then trying to get from real cities what are the conditions and what are the differences into that eh? we can take other cities eh? but anyway we have the chance to approach these cities from different points of view different contexts and to to look at them eh? and that produced these four books that they are available if you want to see but those are books that they are test about this hypothesis on the urban grids eh? but finally from the seminars we approach 101 cities eh? and that it produced what uh, Kate was presenting before, the Urban Grids book that now is already translated and published. It will be presented one of these weeks uh, after the, pan the, the pandemic period. 
that is being translated to the regular. And because the way the idea of regular city, I think it's clear, but not all the cities are regular in the history. Yeah. Then we know that there are always this fantastic debate between Camillo City on the left and Otto Wagner on, on the right, probably in ideological terms will be the other way around, but doesn't matter. What is important is Camillo City did a fantastic job understanding the quality of the plazas in Central Europe and in Italy eh? and, and drawing them and discovering the reasons that say, okay, here is the pedagogy of the city. What we discover on that is what we have to apply in the development of the city of the future. Camillo City has this idea. Wagner was in, in Vienna proposing another type of approach. You can see here, both of the same time period, eh, the beginning probably uh, beginning of the, the 20th century, where you can see really the modern approach for the city already, even that Wagner is considering that the, the new city has to dialogue with the historical city. Eh? This debate still today is present when we have the discussion about what new urbanism is proposing or what sort of extension we can do in the cities. I think these two guys are essential. And these positions is something that we have to, but perhaps today, when we are going into the, and we are entering into that, we discover that most of our urban wall is gridded. We did this exercise in 101 cities that they are here. And then you can see that they are from different cultures, from different latitudes. I mean, in a way that then you can start studying what are the regularity based on, in a way. That is something you can you can visit in the book and you, you, can, you can come up with your own conclusions. But now I want to develop two main arguments. One is, what are the reasons why the cities are regular? Not in what sense are they regular or are they following the same geometry? I'm not talking about the patterns, if not the reasons why. Because I think it's very important to understand when we are des designing one fragment, what's for, why we do that, and uh, who is backing this project, and what is the social conflict that we can may not solve, but we may address, and sometimes we can help in solving. Huh? Then, when we look at the history, I'm just passing briefly into that, you can see that it was this very powerful argument to say that the cities were based on the uh, translation of ideas. Huh? That was the ideal city. Then we study these examples uh, from Europe, and then we map them. And then you can see this beautiful, extremely beautiful from the Renaissance period, most of them, where the design of the city was based in one idea. With this idea, you can develop, you can deploy all the elements, the streets, the center, the protection, the way that the city can be developed, can be implemented, all these type of things. And, that, and then you have Palmanova, which is a beautiful example. Huh? Then we said, perhaps today, our exercise is not only to repeat what the Renaissance books are telling about the city, but how do we interpret Palmanova today? And then probably is when we start our exercise of redesigning in urban design terms, how this example being implemented, how probably, that doesn't mean that this is exactly like the book of Palmanova is telling us, but the way that we can understand perhaps some axes are more important. How you make a city with, with three elements and five entrances. I mean, there are certain geometrical questions that they are asking us the way you can organize or reorganize the neighborhoods that compose that. Yeah? Or the example of Nancy, extremely beautiful city in the north uh, of France, yeah? where you can rediscover that this city is always following certain type of decisions in the history, but also certain patterns that we can discover and perhaps we can reuse today. This exercise explained us about something that was very important. Do we have a simple idea to design the city? Probably not. But probably we can learn from the cities and we can reinterpret 
the idea that perhaps the cities can be also base with what quite simple it is. And when we have the chance to do a city or company town or city like that, then probably these examples can help us a lot. The second important idea for building a, a regular city in the history has been colonizing a territory, uh, controlling a territory. I think that was in many, many cases. Uh, but we took this example and we tried to research and to map, and that is the south of France. This is the Pyrenees. Uh, when you look at that and then you place the cities in that period, then we discover that the colonization of this place, it was done through cities by the Bastides, B A S T I D E S, Bastides. This is the French term that they are using. The funny thing is that the question is that you build the city and then the surrounding, this is for agricultural uses, most of them. This is the, I'm talking about the 13th century. And then when the, the range is over, then you build another city, another, another. But that was the way that the French from the north, they start occupying and controlling the territory. But attention, the British were coming from this side and they were doing the same. The cities, the regular cities was the strategy. And that is the product today. When you visit the cities, they're beautiful, they're amazing. But for us, it's very important to understand what are the design final strategy of these options. Eh? Some of them are a wallet, this is Egmorte, a beautiful, beautiful city next, um, next to the, the sea, is a, a very close distance to the sea. And that could be the way you can understand that in a certain moment, the colonization was used as by cities. Anyway, eh? Similar, we can say, if we make the discussion in the book, you could find the Latin American cities the way that certain parts of the East or North America was also based on that. And then we can see that there are different reasons why the colonization takes a single model or not, is the way there is a, a design model for it or not. The third important reason is when we use the, the formal um, regular city for organizing the territory. I think this is a very important is not colonizing because the territory, if you take a, one of the most external example is the Roman centuriazione. No? That is quite well explained. But when you map that, then you can discover how important it was. It comes from, from England until Middle East, the North of Africa, all that was control. But it was organized. They were not able to control that, but organize them all. And that probably by making a system of the water and the roads, they create this system that is operating. Eh? That, that you can see that uh, to do the exercise of mapping those elements and discovering where still the Roman uh, layout is operating, then you discover the tools and then you can see this territory. It's not by chance, the geography never produced this type of territory, it's human. Uh, effort that make it. And then sometimes we tend to imagine that the Roman cities are explained like the main reason of the Romans. We don't believe after the research. It's more to organize the territory and the cities were part of this organization. It was the place where they were settling the, the army and was like a camp in the way of this immense uh, system operating into that. Eh? Then you, you can see still today and the map this very powerful idea. And some people imagine that the Jeffersonian idea uh, to um, organize United States, the great part of the Western of United States, it was following the Roman. Perhaps even you feel that way. Uh, our hypothesis in the research is that is not true. When Jefferson did this operation, this beautiful, extraordinary operation in the United States, the Roman, the Roman centuriazione was not known. Why? Because sometimes we, we lost the history and then we recovered the history. And that was, it was rediscovered, it was discovered when already Jefferson was in place. 
we are rising, if you want, uh, still you have the chance to look into the book, but we feel that Jefferson was the American ambassador in Paris. It was a discussion in France to organize the whole system in France. And then they make something that was quite similar what Jefferson applied in 1784 in in the United States. This is an amazing system. Is uh, well, you know very well, and that's uh, there are a lot of books about that. Is a very precise system, and I think it's an amazing exercise. It's an amazing, we can say, urban design plan, whatever you want to name, but it's amazing. I like the hypothesis that Corvos was writing about that. He said, "This is the most impressive urban design project ever made." Why? because they were designing without a map. When Jefferson made this proposal, it was adopted. It was not any information what was happening in these lands. They were mountains, they were out of water, it was what, but it was implemented. It's very precise the way that this, um, all these elements, you can see here the distortion in a way that because of the, the length of the lines into the, the curve of the, of the earth, in a way, yeah, that is the reason. Then you have this fantastic operation, very precise. Any fragment that you take, this is in Urbana and in Illinois. In a way, that's okay. Then, my final, I mean, we can continue with that, but another very important is the question in the 19th century, the grid, the regular city was proposed the way of expanding the cities. Yeah? And that was probably the case of this beautiful uh, project that, that most of you, the ones that they are, you are studying at Columbia, I'm sure you are studying is a beautiful project. 1811 is the extension of, of Manhattan. Yeah. And the construction of this system into the territory, it makes a fascinating exercise. I think for me is amazing. And then when you compare, like we did in this uh, studio, when we compare the, the proposal on the project and the existing reality, I think it's amazing to see how real and how loyal the plan and the reality were meeting meeting quite well together. And then to talk about the distortions and why the distortions can be explained, all these are the elements that we like very much in the way it was implemented into the topography. It was not easy to get this reality like that. We again can come up with the conclusion that without so beautiful urban design plan, if we can name this way, Manhattan perhaps would not go, would, wouldn't be like, like it is today, so powerful, interesting, rich and variety of city. Yeah. And I think this is a similar discussion that we can do in, in Barcelona. Yeah. You know that I'm, I'm based in Barcelona. I think Barcelona was uh, small like that. That was the wall of town and Cerda, in 1859, make a proposal of extending the city 10 times bigger. It's probably at the same scale that Manhattan. The people of that period were thinking that Ferda was crazy. They said, this guy must be mad because nobody can imagine that. But if you do the same exercise, you, you can see how important. And, and I think I like to stress that these urban design projects are so well followed because they are very simple, very precise, and very smart in the decisions that they are taking. Sometimes we do the projects for the city and we tend to put too much on it. It's like when you are cooking, if you want to put everything that is in the freezer, then it's a disaster. You have to be very selective what you, and what, what is the order of these things. And I think this is what is so extraordinary about that. And sometimes a good urban design project is the one that intervenes in only some actions, and those actions are the one that everybody can understand, or almost everybody can share, and they can continue. See the way of opening uh, the streets in that reality and producing that that has nothing to do with Manhattan, but has the same rigor, the same way of developing and making that um, so extraordinary. And we sometimes we tend to imagine, well, Manhattan and Barcelona are special. No, it's not true. Like Manhattan, they were developments like that in Boston, in many other cities. Oh, those are the cities that we study in Spain, you know, like the ones that you discover. But we did the same exercise in Italy. 
is Scandinavia. I mean, in all these places you have in the 19th century, the expansion of the city is done by these type of projects, urban design projects, and they are all different. I think that is what is very important because there is a different designer behind each decision. And I think it's our responsibility to make, and also now as a research, we have to evaluate why Milano is more or less interesting, or sorry, Madrid, than Barcelona. What are the values of that? This is Madrid. I mean, so the way that then we have to evaluate that and we have to, to come up with this idea. Eh? Here you have Italy, you have Sweden, and you have Spain, eh? the, the way that these elements are compared or we can compare. The second part of this um, discussion in favor of the regularity is how we can discover the logics of that. Because at the same time, we can agree that most of our urban grids sometimes are very simple. We can say even very banal. They are sometimes done just to sell off pieces of land. But when we start looking at them carefully and we start overlapping, you can discover that there are certain strategies about the hierarchy, about the dimension. And that is when these research start providing a certain values uh, and how these values can be connected with certain uh, climate conditions or certain cultural uh, values. Uh, and I think this is what, in the end, we have to learn and we have to start taking into consideration. The same about how the construction of the urban form can be done. What are the models? Eh? After the research, we come up with the idea that today is a, a rich variety eh? because we, when we discovered we researched 101 city, we could see that along the history, the blocks were becoming bigger and bigger. But today we can see that we are struggling with big and small, and sometimes there are blocks that they are multi-blocks in the way that they are, we have in a situation that is very interesting. Other dramatic and extraordinary moment is the idea of the multi-layering city. Like we saw in this example in Delft, we can see that most of our cities, they have this type of special knots are produced in places where you have a lot of public transportation together. And those are places probably that make sense to get bigger density and to make better use of those spaces, like could be these examples in near the stations in London, this King's Cross, or you can see this example over the train in Barcelona. That is a beautiful, this is a more humble high line. You have the, <laughs> you have the paradigm, but anyway, this, uh, um, places connected to infrastructure that could be also used for the people. And that is a very popular area. It's not um, like probably the, the district in, in Manhattan, but anyway, that all examples where you can see with this, the way that examples like uh, Leal in, in Paris, how these public transportation knots can also imply and can produce also parks and facilities that they are primary users in our cities, on the city centers. And then when we have a sort of image of what type of cities are they producing, we can see things like that. And I think it is very important. Sometimes it's not the image that we have perhaps of the beginning of the Manhattan plan. Today, great part of the, of the grid sometimes is a green grid in the way that is crossing our cities. Huh? places where the water and the green and the spaces are together, eh? as places like that. I think there is a, a new dimension that we have to introduce with that. Eh? And then I think I like just to, to conclude, to summarize and to say, well, we have seen that when we were talking about retrofitting the city, and that is the example of Toledo, you remember very well, for us, it's quite important to consider that perhaps the most valuable dimension of the, of the project is not only that, that you solve the mobility of that. No, it's the idea that you said at the beginning, you remember that I mentioned to say that topography, the geography of the place and the quality of the buildings 
is the most important dimension of the plan. You hardly see here, but you, I can point it out where is the plan. You could find on the red small spots where the intervention and some green, and you can see here this going up. Eh? This element is drawn here and the other is drawn there. Is a way that then is the city. And I feel that's very important that in our city, sometimes the plan is the drawing of the city. And then in this drawing is where we can feel and we can discuss. And then after the negotiation and the discussions with the, the citizens of this area, you can come up that this green has a priority that the other green because it's more central. I mean, those are the ways that the cities can produce. And then this idea that the infrastructure that was very damaging our cities can be refurbished and, and make the new life for the city and create a new center into the center, in a way, recovering this idea of the past, or this idea, even the plan that is a strategy that we did in Barcelona when the city was <clears throat> fighting and struggling for the Olympics in 92, which you can see that the plan is done by pieces that has no any special form. Those are the centralities that they are proposed in Barcelona. After 25 years, they are built them all. But it's not a nice plan. You can say, well, doesn't have any beautiful shape. No, because the shape is the shape of the city. The only thing is that we discover that in this city that was fully built, there were some empty spots, mainly connected to the rail or all industries or derelict land that can be reactivated. And you can see here at the top, 85, that the space was the waterfront of Barcelona. Industrial, derelict land uh, without any, any work already because the industries were already abandoned eh, because they were out of the cycle. Then you can put, is this one, the Olympic Village, which is there. And then you can clean all this waterfront and making space for the, the beaches. And that is the way it looks today. Okay. Then with this, my initial question about, are we more in favor of the plans of the project? Probably I would say that the, my answer today is that we need both. We need plans and projects. We cannot, in, and then we'll be asked to you after the discussion with the city, with the citizens, with the people interested in the improvement of the city, what are the best mechanisms? Do we need a strategy that considers the whole city? And you have the chance for that because you are planning the transformation, allowing the Olympics to do these type of things, or you don't have this capacity. And then the only thing is that we want is to solve the problem of the the cutoff of the infrastructure, and then we want to, to make it a real action for the city. And the action today, I feel in most of our cases, is about reinterpreting the infrastructure. Our infrastructure are still damaging a lot of our cities. We must also select the critical knots, the places where there are a lot of people using those places, because by improving that, you are creating comfort and better quality for the people using those places. In general, I think we have to avoid this idea of the zoning of the city that is done by different users. I think mixing users, even that sometimes we don't have very creative and different users, but we have to struggle how we can get it done. And finally, because integrating the public space. I think public space is also, we can see that everywhere. We can see the improvements done in Manhattan, improvements done everywhere. It's not only a question of Europe because, no, it's not a question of the south of Europe because we have good weather. No, the north of Europe, they are enjoying also using the public space. But I discovered uh, last year visiting Shanghai also, they like it. And going to the north of Africa, they like it. I mean, it's the way the public space is the element probably is the clue of the, the civic condition of the city, eh? probably then by tightening together infrastructure, the mixed use, selecting the critical knots and mostly using the public space, we can fabricate probably good strategies, either at the level of the, we can call it the overall city or a large fragment of the city that I, I call that plan, 
plan doesn't mean that we solve all the problems of the city. We have to avoid this idea, it was wrong, and it is wrong. The plan sometimes could solve certain dimensions of the city, about the public space, about the mobility, about the way that nature can be more embedded into the city. And then I feel, again, our school teachers will look at our reality. Today, our reality is changing in the dimensions and the way that the, the governance is organized. The mobility changing the form of the maps and the shapes of the map. You can see the, how the high speed train is changing the geography of the map. We know that the planes very soon are going to be friendly in terms of the, the energy that they are using. And there is a gigantic change in the way the mobility. Yeah? We have to consider that the mobility is, doesn't mean the movement. The mobility doesn't mean what a friend of mine is calling the motility in the way, the capacity that we have to make choices. And I think that's very important. Yeah? The people don't like that we decide that they have to take the bus or they have to call the taxi or they have to, to use the car. They want to make choices. I want today to use the bicycle and tomorrow I'm going to walk and the next I'm going to to use whatever. I'm going to share the, the car with my friend. Anyway, that's uh, okay. And that I think is the, the way that I like to, to end that this talk with the idea that probably our cities, that is another image of Barcelona, a recent exercise that we did. Sometimes we feel that the city is ending and then is nature there. Perhaps today we have to stress more our capacity to imagine that these two elements are matching together and they are defining elements that they are sometimes we can name more city-like, but the nature is part of the city and then the city also can be using certain parts of nature. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, and for time, I'm going to turn it over to Professor David Smiley to help moderate Q&A. And, um, and if you have a question or if you'd like to turn on your camera, now would be a great time to do so. So uh, Professor Busquets can see as well. Thanks again for this extraordinary lecture. David. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Busquets, for uh, a wide ranging lecture. There's um, uh, both important ideas about uh, strategy and, and techniques, uh, and a great history lesson for for us that would I would love to uh, teach that class <laughs> and um, and, a, and a great kind of consideration of um, the difficulties of of what we call the city or you could also call the extended city as I think you're also inferring or the city that requires uh, some kind of transformation or <clears throat> and so um I guess I want to. Um, you mentioned you talk about the plan, not merely as a, a kind of architectural plan, but the plan as a kind of survey device. That's not your words; those are my words. But the, 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 to look at plan, to use the plan as a um, the plan of the city essentially is a, a, a vital <clears throat> instrument to understanding. Um, the questions that might arise in the city, um, and the the plan as a kind of I think of uh, Getty's thinking of the plan as a as a, a survey, as I say, and so I th I wonder if you could say a little bit more about <clears throat> other ways or which or or other, just your thoughts on to help the students understand what we mean by what Getty said survey before plan, or in your case survey is plan. Mm. All right. Thank you, David. No, <clears throat> no. Honestly, I feel that with the tools we have today, is easier than probably it was before. But sometimes the tools we have, uh, referring to the GIS and many of these open source map. I mean, we have many of these elements, but those are there. But what for me is very important is that those elements have to be our tools, and sometimes we have to reshuffle, we have to redesign, we have to, and then we make our own interpretation of that place. And that, and then is when I feel a very dry survey, it becomes perhaps a strategy, or it becomes something that you can show 
the problems of the diagnosis of the city in a way. And that the, I think a great deal of, the, of our work as a researcher, but also as a professional, we have to try always to discover new dimensions. If not, if we cannot make a, a clear analytical uh, conclusion, I feel that we should not be authorized to make any proposal. Um, I have uh, a couple of um, specific questions that uh, kind of follow some of my own interests, I might add, <clears throat> which um, in particular, uh, the Vinex plan in the Netherlands and um, and also your discussion of, well, the VNX plans, which I think, if I understand correctly, um, is, a, is a kind of better version of the uh, new town idea, as you said. It's a way of spreading population. It's a way of uh, dispersing jobs as well as housing. And um, <clears throat> I, I wonder, is that a strategy that you can see as a as a more global strategy, a kind of uh, a suggestion for not focusing on centralization so much as as almost um, um, making of uh, smaller nodes that would contain certain kinds of, of uh, growth potential. Hmm. No, I think I think you're right. Your interpretation is correct. I think probably this model cannot be. I, I agree. Is a sort of reinterpretation of the new town because it's a decentralization idea. But the Netherlands is the densest country in the world. The way that they are, and the way then they need these strategies to avoid that otherwise the population can come together and produce uh, a gigantic megalopolis. As the way, and then is a network, it's a network of cities. In the way, then adding pieces into that. I'm not now in in my answer to you, eh, David, uh, allow me to say I'm not evaluating that the Phoenix is positive or negative. I'm just describing that and, and using that. And eh, that, that is not the, the main theme in, in my lecture. The discussion about the how the growth or how the dynamics should be placed, that for me is another very important story in a way eh, that uh, I think is a, is a key uh, important argument. I think the four models uh, that you presented to us um, is a kind of open opens the door to a whole host of other models. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to um, forward a question by uh, Graham Shane, um, who um, asks, uh, "What about the vertical dimension of the grid? Skyscrapers in the grid, super talls in the grid. Does that?" change the grid? Does that um, stress the grid? You know, are there limits to the grid? That last bit was me, not Graham. <laughs> Graham, <laughs> hello, be. how are you? Very nice to, to hear from you. <laughs> okay. well, thank you for, for, for your question. No, no I, think, I think your question is, is pertinent. It's, it seems to me, I would um, suggest that the vertical discussion about the grid has a lot to do with the special knots. What I was describing uh, in my uh, last part of when I was saying, probably the, the place where we discover uh, very interesting is what I, I was describing like the multi-layer city. In the multi-layer city probably is where probably the vertical grid uh, makes sense, uh, but that is more, um, today I was more talking about the, the way we can address, we can understand, we can see more dimensions into the idea of regularity. That was my idea, but I fully agree that the vertical should be in itself uh, another type of um, discussion. In the end, uh, Graham, I think, and probably all your, your research is very much uh, in this direction. The power um, of our theory is that it shows that when you open one window, you discover many things to research and to is sometimes we feel and in our uh, 
uh, schools, sometimes we tend to imagine too much about the, the design per, uh, for the design in itself, for the sake of designing. I think it's very important to understand why and, and to understand the logics that they are behind the design, then our design will be stronger. And only when the design is strong, is capable of giving answer to many questions. I think that is the difficulty of the urban design. And that is the difference between the urban design and the architectural design. The architectural design produces one thing to be built. Urban design produces one thing that addresses many things that could happen within that. And I think this is the, the lesson of Manhattan in the end, no? that makes almost everything possible. Um, it's interesting you, you put it that way, because um, that takes me to uh, Barcelona, where you are right now, I take it. Um, you showed an uh, image um, of Serta's plan, and one thing that's always important for me uh, is just not the camfered or chamfered uh, street corners, but in fact, the morphologies of the blocks that that Serta wanted to create, that there was different ways of opening sides, opening corners, creating different uses into the, the center of his diff different blocks. I think that kind of flexibility uh, in the idea is more than, as you say, it's more than a grid. It's a kind of, um, a kind of, uh, this kind of taking iterations of the grid in different parts. Mm -hmm. And so given that, that start, which I think is often, under acknowledged in in the Barcelona plan, <clears throat> would be um, what is your what are your thoughts on the current uh, new super blocks uh, that are kind of being created in Barcelona? Uh, the kind of nine block idea, I think it is, with whole changes to pedestrianization, to automobile routes, to public safety, to quality of air, etc. I'm assume you're following that to some degree <laughs> out your window, perhaps. Mm. Mm. I think the um, my um, I think this is a, um, an important question, David. I think the 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 grid system in Barcelona or in Manhattan or in Boston has its own logic. Um, to change the general logic is not easy. Then for me, the question, the key question is that uh, when we do this type of exercise, uh, we want to do this type of exercise, we have to test seriously and to see the pros and cons of that. In a way. Because we cannot imagine that we are reshuffling uh, the city only according to one dimension. Of course, pollution we are against is very clear, the pollution, the question of the car. I mean, all these things need, needs to be addressed, but that needs to be addressed for the whole city, uh, in Manhattan, in Mumbai, in Barcelona, everywhere. That's a, and that takes certain time, but we have to put energy for that. But if that implies a change in the model, I'm not so sure, honestly. And then, um, of course, you the advantage of a grid is that you can try and you can dismantle and you can do that easily in a way eh? that that in a way then it's good to do that and to see what is the implications about the users about this of course one thing is the the way that Therda was planning the city and the other is how the city has been executed it's like in Manhattan as a way eh? that and you cannot say that Manhattan today is against the original plan no because the original plan it was impossible to imagine how we are living today and the subways and all this type of things the way that then is a project that is always continuously redone. But I would really um, advise to take very much into consideration this idea of the test, uh, testing and looking what what happened. And that a test like that, it will take you a few years because then you are going to see how the ground floor works. Or the, anyway, I remember I was working personally involved very much on the idea of opening the couriers of in Barcelona in the in the blocks because originally Cerda was proposing that anyway. but of course the speculation and you know uh, then they fill uh, all the block yeah? and then by opening that and that it took a while and today there are more than 40 that they are open but I'm not again I'm not so sure after opening 40 blocks that they are very success quite successful 
I think now is it will be the right moment of discovering what are the ones that they are working better than others. Because some are safer than others, you know, this type of thing. And always urban design is continuously questioning new things, not just to say that everything done is, is wrong, no, but just improving. I think this is something that, uh, but at the same time, I, I think in this exercise about the, the urban grid and regular city, we have to keep in mind what is the, the overall picture and how we are improving. I mean, we have to work uh, the different scales. Eh? Yeah, I think we'll be following Barcelona to see how it's growing and, and continuing to experiment, sure. as you say. I think it's really um, a great uh, kind of continuation of the morphology of, of CIRDA. Uh, I think um, another question comes from Dilip de Kuna, another faculty member. Um, and he's asking us to, um, he says that cities are receiving immigrants. Mm. And um, there's a lot of pressure and conflict over that, no, uh, especially in European cities, but all over the world. And um, he's wondering <clears throat> how this situation impacts what you think about defining public and private space, which is clearly a, a key aspect of, of the things you, the way you describe the city today. Right. right yeah. hmm. No, I think that's a good, a good point. No. I would suggest, of course, now, um, Perhaps our cities are suffering also because of the, the change on the rim, because of the pandemic and all these type of things are a very difficult period in general. I think all we are still crossing. But going to um, back to the real wall, and we hope that uh, very soon into that, I think the question of how um, immigrants must be uh, part of the part of the system. I think that is is an issue that. Of course, it's different in a big city, that uh, mid-sized city, but uh, that should be addressed properly, because otherwise, to um, imagine that that doesn't exist, I think, is not uh, is not giving a good solution. We can see that in in some cities in Europe. In the way, I think that that should be like um, immigration has been always part of the of the cities. I mean, so I, the, our city has been always receiving new people. I mean, the question is that to finding the way that these people can be integrated doesn't need to be a plan for it, but to make a reason for that, because in some cases are posing some real housing question. Uh, how, what sort of housing it should be transitional housing or is definite housing? Are they coming with the family or they want to, I mean, this type of thing. In general, in Europe, um, population is aging is the way that then I think, I mean, there are many questions that should be addressed seriously. It's not a question of imagine that. Uh, I think now Europe has to do a, a gigantic exercise onto that. And, and perhaps again, is more a question that perhaps certain um, type of immigration should be uh, promote more and meet uh, size cities where probably uh, jobs are more uh, easier. I, I, I mean, these type of things needs to be discussed. And probably that is different in Denmark than the Spain or in Portugal. I mean, this is, uh, but this discussion I think is a very important because it has urban design implications, uh, very serious. Philippe, uh, thank you for your question. I know your books and I'm, I'm following your, your work. Thank you. You. Uh, yes, this is a that's an issue that uh, we deal a lot with um, in our international and New York based studios. So, right. um, um, <clears throat> another student, uh, Ahmed, asks um, for a little clarity on on how you deal with the um, edges or the or the the kind of outskirts of cities. Um, and what kind of boundary, if any, is something that fits into a, the kind of format that you're you're discussing today? Mm. Well, the, no, I think it's um is an important question. I feel that the, for me we have to avoid the idea of the edges. I think that the last diagram I show 
in general, um, we all we tend to imagine that the cities has a, an an edge because that was the medieval concept that the city has a wall and then outside the wall is the 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 countryside. In a way, eh? that was sometimes we as designers we tend to imagine like that and and from the modern ideas we were what what we they were doing they were making a line around and they put uh, a boulevard uh, they call a ring road uh, just to bypass and uh, that was the idea many plants are done since the world war ii with this model by the way then what happened you do this line and then the city immediately start building outside this line that that is because infrastructure attracts growth is the way that the way then the idea of edge for me is an idea that has to be incorporated into the idea of the city in a way eh? that i feel that is more the idea that nature and the city has to um, meet each other uh, has to enter each other sometimes that looks more difficult but it's not difficult because you have always lines of water you have valleys you have uh, creeks you have many elements just make them reveal huh? and make it more i think that's way then you have cities that they are more open to the territory you know? which is against this idea of the closing uh, is against the medieval model in the way that i feel is completely out of the, the idea of the ideal city i was showing from the renaissance because in those days they were thinking the city's wall because it was a fortress the way today our cities doesn't need a fortress any longer fortunately Um, yeah, the, 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 the edges are no longer edges, you know, they're, they're, um, it's, it's a gradient, um, always now for better or worse, because it has a whole array of complications. Um, <clears throat> um, one other, uh, question that is here has to do with, um, I think a really interesting observation by Lucas that's um on the one hand you present a, a a history of layers a history of of the kind of uh, building up over time of how cities um, take shape and are experienced um and he's and he's wondering also therefore about the link to um the kind of generic logic or replicable uh, logics or morphologies um and he, he's looking for you to kind of clarify the relationships between what he sees as two different ways of thinking and working. Yeah, probably the, the idea of the layers means it's a good tool for understanding complexity. But then probably as far as we start um, dealing and understanding these uh, different layers, we discover that some layers are more relevant than others. Some layers are, and here is where probably the the natural layers, the geography and the natural layers are extremely important. Another that sometimes we are, um, because if not, we tend to imagine very much that infrastructure is the key layer, no? That is the tradition because the way the roads are very much um, demanding and they are, establishing many many rules but probably we have to give priority to the to the geography and nature to to make it in a way to make it more effective as the way that's a, then there are other layers that sometimes are that could be sometimes very simple housing but some type of we cannot call monumental but certain type of elements that they are very much identifying the place and they are creating the, the importance of the place and i think this is the way we can then balance and then by shifting the, the layers you start making your own um, interpretation of the city and then you are privileging certain layers but usually the projects that we do in the city the intervention the actions within the city probably they are merging and they are linking different layers that probably is the way but i think it's a is a quite important pedagogic uh, effective pedagogical tool that's a, not only in the school but also to to be able to explain what this uh, city or this neighborhood can reach out uh, uh, 
into that, uh, what are the priorities as well. We have to make, and I think this is um, something that we can do, but we have to create new sort of new paradigms. If you imagine a public participation session, and we said um, this project that we are that we are discussing now, the A solution has fifty dwellings. The B solution has seventy-five dwellings. Who wants A or B? But sometimes we have to discover that perhaps seventy-five can can be beneficial for other reasons. And then our cliche, and that we are responsible. We, I'm meaning the, the people that they are working on this field. We create lower density, better than higher density. Uh, okay. We have to prove it. Because that comes from 50 years ago. It comes from other generations that they were establishing this idea. Just go to the suburbia, lower density, enjoy your 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 garden and so on. Okay. Is that what what we are proposing, no. If we are talking about certain patterns of mobility, we need to, to change all these cliches and we have to invent new logics and we have to communicate that also with the media. With We have to make our an effort to introduce other type of values. And those values, of course, should be shared by community. Of course, today I feel there is an important trend about um, about environmental issues, about all this climate change. This is very important, yeah? it's very important. But we don't know yet the translation into the urban design issues. And that is something we have to work hard on that because not everything is very, is, is too simple. You know, following up on that, and I think this will be wrapping up, but, um... To me, you raised the question of, of politics here. Um, the, the, the morphologies that you've shown us today uh, are a fascinating uh, kind of narrative of urban design. And the students, at least at Columbia, don't hear the word morphology very often, for better or worse. Um, and I like the idea of, of keeping a sense of the the material reality of, of cities. But you yourself, as you talk about values, um, it seems to me that, that you're, you're introducing the, a role for some kind of political tension, political uh, contest um, over decision-making. And that's actually something we stress much more at Columbia. And I'm wondering how you, how you would envisage uh, these kind of two realms of, let's say, morphology and politics, just for lack of a greater vision right now, um, does that, would you see us moving going forward or how does that affect your own research as you, you mentioned the need for attention to, to such things? No, I think that the two, for me, the two things are at essential. Uh, the question is that Sometimes I'm a little bit critical when we said, well, urban design is always about following what politics decided. I don't buy exactly that. In a democratic condition, there are many different platforms where our ideas and our contribution, our research can help in rising certain um, platforms that they can also make better cities or can change the priorities into the city, into the official cities. I think, and that is something that our research at the university has to, to make it clear in the way. And, and our young professionals are the ones that they are able to reveal other, other readings and other strategies. I don't feel that we as designers, if we want to keep our role as designers, we are going to change society. But it's not true that we cannot influence the change in society. We are influencing. And then as a way, then by because we are, must be aware that we are influencing, we have to act properly in that in that respect. And then we know and I tend to imagine that 
any one of us and probably some of the young um, people that they are attending your, your lectures, uh, probably they don't know if they are going to be working for a city or working for a community group or working as an independent designer. I, mean, I can tell that most probably they are going to do the different things along, along his professional life. And I think that's very important that then we must be prepared and in any side of the table that we are going to be sitting, we have to be responsible of what we are advising. Because when we are advising uh, with the public authorities, that doesn't mean that we have to follow. We have to advise them about. Then they will follow or not. It's their responsibility in a way. Yeah? But I think we have to be very clear and very neat about that in a way. Yeah? That, uh, that's the, I feel that is our social commitment as a, as a designers in a way. If not, it's better that when we don't do urban design, we do other jobs. There are many other jobs in a way. Yeah? So that doesn't mean that we are always fighting against everyone, no, but we have to be very clear and very responsible about these, these things. That's it. Okay, uh, the students have a few minutes to take a break before the discussion sections begin, at which time, um, and I, we don't attend, it's the students' own discussion about what they've heard today and what they've read. Um, yeah. And so thank you so much, I really appreciate um, the kind of uh, large scale view you offer us. And I, for one, um, still think more that we need to join the kind of morphological understandings with social and political ones. Um, and um, I, I kind of like to remind myself that, you know, Aldo, Aldo Rossi and his morphological kind of uh, finesse uh, was also deeply um, a political thinker. And I just think that we have to struggle with that still in probably utterly new ways, but uh, this is a great guide to um, thinking about the connection. So Kate, uh, back to you. Echoing the thanks and uh, hope to hear from you again soon and, and be in close con contact and collaboration. Thanks again, everyone for joining and uh, best wishes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, thanks a lot. Bye-bye eh? okay. everyone. Bye-bye.